everybody and welcome to welcome back to Meet the Makers podcast. My name is Jack Blanche. This is Roy Gerbrands. Howdy. This is uh, the episode where we talk to Jeremy Mount mm-hmm. of Woodchester Valley. We shot this earlier today, but we came back just to record a little bit of an intro for him because he deserves it. What a man. Yeah, really interesting. <laughs> man, like I think I mentioned mentioned this in the podcast, but but anyone who hasn't had a little taster of, of Woodchester Valley wine... Like I had, you gave me a bottle for my birthday, mm-hmm. and I snacked the whole thing in one sitting over over a Zoom party. It is Easily delicious, done. delicious, it's beautiful wine. Yeah, yeah. We're really special. And uh, Jeremy really gets into the science and his history and winemaking and all of the places he's been around the world, the key wine regions: New Zealand, France, Germany, and America. So yeah, it's a pretty interesting one. Yeah. Man, uh, I didn't realize as well that different wines, different countries have better wines. Uh, yeah, for like, like signature wines. Signature wines for yep. each country. Uh, yeah, like, yeah, for sure. I, I'm sure that's probably common knowledge to everyone else but me. Uh, but um, like different Chardonnays are best come best come from this country. Sauvignon Blancs best come from this country. Mm-hmm. Just depending on depending on the vineyards, depending on the temperature, the weather, all that sort of stuff. Even elevation of fields and stuff. I know that, that I never knew that yeah well yeah. glad I'm not the only one then yeah uh, we definitely learned something for sure yeah well hopefully you guys will as well enjoy thanks for inviting us to your beautiful tasting room as well no. yeah I forgot we are we are not at the shop today we are actually we are actually at the vineyard and we're yeah. at the shop so thank you very much for having us well thanks for asking yeah nice to um to meet you both up here yeah so this is Sorry. How long has this been here, basically? I'm sure we're um, about to go into it, go into that. Yeah, um, just pretty briefly, right at the moment, this tasting was only half the size. Um, here, the wall from just after lockdown extended it into to the double size. It was only half. This was a full wall going across, and um, yeah, just extended because after lockdown, doing uh, the uh, social distancing, and um, so yes, yeah, so it's just been developed. In the last few months, really, the actual taste we've been going for about three years. Yeah. Fantastic! Oh, mm. that good to see you guys making the most out of the time as well. I mean, mm. there's, there's a lot. Obviously, there's a lot kind of happening um, whilst we're all inside and not really doing very much. So it looks like you made the most of it. Basically, it looks very nice. Yeah. And you've got a wine tasting this afternoon as well. Uh, yes, at the moment we've got eleven wine, t- eleven tours per week. Um, most days, two tours a day. We do um, the still wine tasting with one sparkling. Then we do one that's just focused on sparkling wines. So um, uh, this afternoon was a sparkling wine one, and then there's one that was at two o'clock. Then six fifteen, we've got one starting for um, all over still and sparkling. So yeah, and we do at sixteen, and it's sold out at the moment. The whole of September is booked up and um, very popular. I think with a lot of people not wanting to travel abroad and the whole staycation, don't really like the word myself, but yeah, yes, same. but the whole, <laughs> the whole staycation, uh, people are using the accommodation we've got here and then booking on the tours and tastings or coming out to the Cotswolds and looking for something local to do, so it's been uh, very popular really. I'm very pleased we extended the tasting room to accommodate more than what would have been eight people at a time, so it's now at 16, so yeah, Brilliant. yeah it's good. But, um, um, yeah, well, uh, obviously, I think because um, we on this show we interview people who are who are supply uh, products and products to the shop in Maiden Stroud. So, how did you guys know each other? How did you guys meet, and how did how did you, this relationship start happening? So, when I started working at Maiden Stroud, um, Claire um, told me that you'd been in and you'd bought lots of pottery for the B and Bs. Yes, I think Fiona's known you for many years. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Fiona and Neil um, own, own the company, and their daughter Chloe, um, and also uh, Neil's mother Mary, who does uh, vintage Mary. Um, mm-hmm. I've known you for many years, mm-hmm. so I think they've always been buying um, things from you. So uh, yeah, but uh, yeah. So yeah. then I said, well, why don't we stock this wine that's made literally on our doorstep? And she was like, oh, I don't know really. And I was on a big mission to um, expand our food and drink at that time. So I spoke to, um, it was a different sales rep at the time, it wasn't Aaron, it was, yeah. was it Mark? Um, well, there's Simon to start with, um, Simon's still with us at the company, mm-hmm. and then it was, um, I forget his name, because he was only with us for a short amount of time, um, 
anyway, but yeah, yeah. then Aaron, yeah. So. Yeah, so um. I, spoke, I spoke to one of your representatives and he was like, yeah, what do you want? So I was like, great, and then we got it in pretty much. You were busy because it was mm. build up to Christmas. Mm. We came over, collected the stock. He kindly gave us a tour of mm. um, the, where you actually process the grapes and make the wine and showed us how you make the bubbly and the yeast and how it's frozen and so on. Yeah. Uh, so that was really interesting. Yeah. And then since then, it's been selling really well. Um, sells really well on our web shop. Mm. So I thought it'd be great if we could get you on the Meet the Makers podcast and talk a bit about your history. Yeah. So would you like to tell us sort of how you started and what got you into wine yeah. making? Well, um, I'd just like to say start with uh, at the beginning that, um, yeah, with, with making wine, it's very much a team effort mm -hmm. and I'm um, the winemaker, so yes, I make the wine. Um, but uh, Fiona in the vineyard and, uh, you know, it's, a, it's one of the major part. You can't make good wine without good grapes at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, um, um, but yeah, from, from my side of things, uh, I joined the company here in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, that was when the winery was built. Um, before that, I worked, well, I first got interested in the wine industry, maybe in my 20s, spent a lot of time traveling around the world and spent quite a few years in South Africa. Um, and saw the wine regions there and the south of France and just saw a really nice environment that you can work in with vines and you know wine and that kind of thing I thought you know this is something that really interests me um, and my mother's half French she lives north of Bordeaux um, so yes always been wine's been a big part of my life so um, did a degree uh, at university in Sussex at Plumpton College uh, which a lot of winemakers in England have uh, graduated from and um, yeah, that was in viticulture and oenology, so the study of oenology, winemaking and viticulture for the whole growing uh, yearly cycle of the vines. And um, from there, just uh, worked abroad, basically, from uh, started California in Napa Valley at Stag's Leap, and then um, I don't know from there. Then South Africa at Rupert Rothschild uh, Winery, so quite a prestigious name over there. Yeah. And, um, and then worked in, in Burgundy, lived in Chablis, worked near, near just outside Chablis, so very appropriate for Chardonnay, which is something, the variety that's going to start taking off, I think, more in England. Uh, mm. We're maybe looking to produce one this year, depending on how the harvest goes. Um, and, and yeah, spent about two and a half years in New Zealand, in, in the South Island in Marlborough, um, uh, which is Southern New Blanc country, so... Uh, Great experience living over there. It's a lovely country. Um, I worked too much, unfortunately, didn't get to see much of the country. So I'd like to travel a bit more, but anyway. Um, and and yes, also worked in Malta. Uh, did a few uh, harvests in England in um, in just outside Hayward's Heath, so Bluebell Vineyards, and I worked at Nightingale. I worked at a lot of places around, really briefly in England. So Rathvinny is a large estate. But, um, when they were just setting up, um, went there for a little while. But I think the most relevant experience to English wine, other than working with sparkling wines in Kent, in Sussex, is uh, probably Germany. I worked in Franconia, um, uh, so on the Bavarian border. And there they make a lot of Bacchus. Mm. Um, Riesling as well, and also Pinot Noir. But... Um, Bacchus is a variety, you know, in Germany it's a variety that's uh, very, um, it's kind of in the shadows of Riesling as a variety, but it makes great wines, um, but it just doesn't get the kind of um, credit I think it deserves as a variety and as a wine over there. So, um, so it's used, it's produced in very high volumes and not such great quality compared to something like the Rieslings. So, um, so yeah, that's really interesting. I didn't realise that different countries are known for making specific types of wine and things like that. Is yeah, no, it's just where the, uh, the varieties. I mean, I've, I've made, for instance, Pinot Noir. I've made Pinot Noir, you know, in California, New Zealand, Germany, a little bit in South Africa, but not so much. Um, and it's different production methods in all the different regions. It's just whether it's a cool climate or a warm climate you know the style of wine you make and so there's some varieties that are very specific to the country and others that are generic kind of varieties that are grown in many countries so uh, Bacchus is um, a variety that's mainly grown in Germany it was um, developed in Germany um, its parentage is Mulitergal um, and Riesling 
and Silvana. So um, it's a variety that um, has very interesting flavours when it's first made, very kind of primary fruits. And then the kind of Riesling elements come through later uh, after a few years, which is a variety that has great ageing potential. So, yeah. That makes me very yeah. suspicious of different wine bottles I'll see on the supermarket now. <laughs> yeah. Chardonnay from, yeah. where exactly? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's not the country where it come from, it comes yeah. from. That's really yeah. interesting. I yeah. didn't realise that. Why wine? Uh, why wine? Uh, why wine? Why did you decide <laughs> that you were going to no, well, I mean, do this? Yeah, well, it was, um, like I was saying, it's something that um, it's always been in my family. Um, I was brought up in Kent, just outside Canterbury, and it was all apple. My family do uh, grow as apple top fruits, so apples and pears. Mm -hmm. That's the history, father, grandfather. So, well, more grandfather, actually, an uncle now, but, um, and it goes back generations. So... That was, it's interesting in fruit farming, but wine is more from, I guess, my mother's side, and it's just always been in our family. And it's just sometimes you just fall into industries there for whatever reason, and maybe from spending time in really nice regions, and, and that's kind of what led me into the interest of it. Um, always been interested in it. Um, uh, but um, yeah, and once you do one vintage in a country, um, you find it very interesting it's really engaging you meet people from all over the world and it's just something that's quite quite it's, like, it's very fun for, especially for somebody who likes traveling in different countries and experiencing different cultures so right. um so from that aspect that's when you kind of get the bug for for the harvest time and um um and yeah it's just um very interesting it's kind of an art it's not art um but it's a creative um industry mm. which has kind of quite interesting characters and people in the industry whether it's in sales or winemaking or in the vineyards um the, the farming side of it it's got quite a few different elements and uh yeah, so it's, it's interesting oh, i'd say that's that's worthy of being called art <laughs> yeah, really? yeah i'd say yeah, yeah, yeah for sure yeah i'd say that's worth it yeah, yeah. that's exactly the definition it's a creative process and it it's makes, quite yeah it makes people feel something as well so. yeah although when it comes to making the wine you, you have the full spectrum of uh winemakers where you have the the movement of natural wines or minimal intervention which is um, being caught on by a lot of the kind of um uh Hipster is the wrong word, but um, <laughs> you know, alternative, have you not seen alternative yeah, yeah, production yeah, yeah. methods. I've got a lot of very good friends that are making some really quirky wines. Yes, um, personally, I, I, you know, I was in New Zealand and it's a lot more lab-based um, mm. work that I did there. It was, it was all in, uh, I was just in the lab basically. So um, you learn more that um, it's good to keep wine production within certain parameters um, to avoid spoilage. Um, to increase the potential of the aromas and the flavours. And for me here, I just want to create really interesting wines, but very kind of clean mm. and fruit driven. And, um, and when you're making like a small batch of wines, um, then of wine, you can, you can experiment a bit with, you know, complexity and different interesting characters, which is great. And maybe you'd like to do the small batches in the future, but it's good to have the full production just to be you know just uh, you get that consistency don't you cons and consistency yeah mm. England's a very difficult country for consistency because we've got such a marginal climate um, and you've got um, uh, from one year to the next with the grapes um, develop at different um, ripenesses um, but shall I open the Bacchus yes um, we, um, I think yeah. I've done enough uh, <laughs> we'll just uh, try that we're talking about Bacchus that's the 18 right this is the 18 yeah it's a so very good year it is a good year it was we had a lot of uh, production um, uh, we had about double the yield of um, Bacchus from the years before um, it's a variety that can handle high yields and um, and it came out really well it got gold in the uh, wine GB West competition that. yeah, congratulations. So, so that's that's good news it's always nice to have I mean it's not you know awards are one thing then you, you know if one competition you get one thing another will be completely different so you can't really judge everything by awards Thank but you. that's a very generous pouring I am driving sorry. later <laughs> so it's always nice to um, yeah, thank to you get very them much. but um but yes yeah, so this is our the two wines I've got uh, to show you today, to show everybody today. Um, okay. I'm sure one of them will capture it. <laughs> um, 
is the Bacchus, uh, our most popular still wine. Uh, we've got Bacchus and Orpheus Bacchus. Orpheus Bacchus is more a small block, usually from the oldest wines we have from Amberley, um, smaller batch. Um, this is from all three sides. Um, the benefit with this Bacchus is that um, it's picked at different ripeness levels. So the Stonehouse site ripens a bit about a week before um, here at Winchester or Amberley. And, um, uh, and we've got Bacchus, the Bacchus, because it's from slightly different soils, has different fruit characteristics as well. So early on, it has a lot more floral, kind of elder flower characters. Mm. Um, and then the later picking, it turns into more tropical, like lychee type characteristics. So for this wine, um, it's nice to have about 10 tanks of Bacchus that are picked at different rates, different times, over about a three week period. And so you can blend this together and it just brings different components for that wine. So, yeah. Brilliant. Oh, cheers. Yeah, cheers. Clink. Yeah. Excellent. Good sound. Good acoustics. If I'm having mm. a date night with my wife, I take mm. one of these bottles home. Yeah. Wow. I love it. Mm. It's so so it's, it started off, it's very aromatic. It still has got a lot of those, those aromas still. Um, but uh, it develops um, really nicely over time, and that's why it's a good wine to go with mm. various fish dishes and that kind of thing. It's good food wine. It can be drunk nicely on, on, on drunk just on, a, on a, like a nice afternoon. But yeah, um, but we were it's a very good food pairer. We were saying on the way up um, if we were doing samples here with this podcast, would we have to do the proper wine tasting when we spit it out at the end? And we were like, mm, nah, no, such a waste. No, I mean, <laughs> can do. I mean, when we do a lot of tastings, obviously, you, you know, you can't just drink all the wines. But um, we do a lot of the blending trials in um, December and January. And so you've got to, you know, always spit the wines out. And for the tours and tastings, often we say to people, everyone has a, a, a spitting, um, spittoon on the table. Mm -hmm. And, um, 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 yeah, it's good to spit them out when you're trying so many different wines. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm. Well, not today, not for me. Mm. <laughs> it's delicious. Yeah. This is very mm. delightful. Mm. So it's um, um, so it's been about when was it? So 2018 bottled in 19, so a year and a half in bottle now, and um, it just develops really nicely um, over time. Really, I'm not in any hurry to sell the Bacchus, and it's something that you know it's got people can buy and just having mm. the cellar for a year, two, three years, no more, no problem. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's delicious. Yeah, mm. and very delicate as well. Still, still kind of tasting it. Yeah, I mean, it's quite. Um, people um, compare it to Sauvignon Blanc, and mm. we grow Sauvignon Blanc here as well at Stonehouse. The Sauvignon Blanc is on the steepest part of the slope. Um, our Sauvignon Blanc we released. We had 2017 Sauvignon Blanc uh, first year, and then 2018 went really well. That did amazingly well in international competitions, got a gold, um, which was great. Um, flew out of the door, but having the two wines together, people say Sauvignon Blanc is the same as Bacchus, English version. It is and it isn't. They're very different varieties, but um, when explaining what Bacchus is like, Sauvignon Blanc would be the nearest comparison mm. to a wine that yeah. most people know. I'd like um, Sauvignon Blanc, but I think yeah. I prefer your Bacchus, definitely. Really? Okay. Yeah, oh, great. Uh, it's nice to own. It's, good. it's got some decent structure as well, which um, helps with, uh, with, food, with food pairings. Yeah, it's yeah. lovely with Denver. Yeah. 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 All right. So what, what are the rules in terms of what you eat with a white and with a red? I think this uh, is a, another point of contention in my household. There is. Well, the first rule is there is no rule. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, there isn't um, really, you know, everybody likes uh, whatever wine they like with whichever food they like. Um, white wines go well with, um, you know, fish dishes or, you know, chicken, white, white meats. Mm -hmm. um, but then you can get some heavily oaked complex aged white wines that would go with, you know, pork or possibly some red meat. I mean, personally, I wouldn't really have white wine with a heavy red meat, but, um, but I'd say... You hear that, Steve? <laughs> yeah, I know you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, yeah, I mean, you know, whatever you, whatever you like to drink uh, the wine with, everyone's got different palates, everyone tastes differently. So, so yes, with the white wines go well with fish dishes and uh, red meats, we'd, we'd recommend, or salads. Um, 
vegetable dishes. Um, um, and red wines go with uh, some fish dishes as well. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a matter of preference. With tannins, it helps with meat. So with red wines, you get a lot of tannins. Um, and so that helps to balance uh, meats, uh, red meats. And acidity as well can help with that with, with fatty dishes. So it's not really my area of expertise. I'm more in the production side of things and the, <laughs> the food pairing. But, um, but yeah. yeah. Wow. I mean, you know your stuff clearly. Yeah. So... Um, so I arrived in 2016, there wasn't a winery. The first plantings here were in 2009, and that was one acre um, over in Amberley. And then 2013 and 14, they um, planted a lot more. Um, currently now up to 55 acres planted. Crikey, yeah. that's, when I looked online last time, it was 45. 45, so yeah, so these right. 10 up here are the next lot. So yeah, so in 2016 I arrived and... Um, I was in New Zealand at the time, ordering tank sizes and all the rest of it, which is quite um, interesting. Uh, interesting thing to do, not really knowing about uh, what the varieties were, or well, neither varieties, but what volumes they were and what wines we'd be making. Um, so I came over and uh, installed the first tanks and the press, 2016, and then since then, each year we bought more tanks if for the increase in volumes as the productions increased and then produced sparkling wines as well as the still wines and to then bought all the equipment for the sparkling wine production which um on the tours they you know it, 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 i'll explain a bit to you i think on the tour mm. um, um so you go through the different types of production difference between still wines and sparkling wine um, sparkling wine is the second kind of phase where it goes the wine goes back into bottle with yeast and sugar to create the fizz and then the yeast has to be extracted uh, via a gyro pallet and a disgorger. But have, people have to come on the tour to, uh, to get into more expl explanation about that. So um, it moves around really slowly, doesn't it? Yeah, so the disgorger, the gyro pallet uh, takes 500 bottles and it goes through uh, 32 phases where it, so it goes around uh, 360 degrees from horizontally to vertically. So um, and that takes six and a half days. So, so yeah, that gets the yeast from horizontal when it's sat in the bottle to vertical when it's just in the neck of the bottle and then we have a disgorger which then takes the yeast out and then we put the cork and the wire hood on. I think the most interesting part for me was that you use liquid nitrogen to freeze the yeast to then take it out. Yeah. That was amazing. Yeah so we have it's uh, they're called, called neck freezer which is <laughs> says it on the tin. Well, on the tin. Anyway and um so the neck freezer has glycol, which is at minus 24 degrees, um, just enough glycol to cover that amount of the bottle, and so it just freeze, freezes that block. And then as you turn the bottle and take off the crown cap, that um, ejects the, um, the plug of yeast, and, um, and then we can put the, wire, the uh, cork on. And then the labelling equipment as well for labelling the sparkling wines. All of the still wines, we have uh, contract bottlers that come in, they do the bottling and then they do all the labelling. So all of these processes were kind of added um, you know, each year, really, um, as um, the company grew. Um, um, but um, Fiona, who runs the, the company, runs the company. She's got an amazing attention for detail and everything in the vineyard and everything uh, from the accommodation side to the vineyard to the winery. Doesn't cut any corners, meticulous detail and everything. Only wanted the best quality equipment to make the best quality wine to like just try and get the, you know, the actual, just do the best you can from the grapes. Um, in this region and we've got really interesting um, soils the limestone is quite unique to this area compared to other wineries and vineyards around the country a lot of um, vineyards are focused on chalk or um, clay um, and especially in the southeast and here we've got which is mimic not mimicking but all the um, Kimmeridgean um, soils in um, Dorset, and that's kind of copying, doing this champagne style, uh, similar soils to champagne. Um, whereas here it's more limestone, which it's not the same as Burgundy, but it's a similar kind of, the Cotswold Brash is similar to, um, soil profile to uh, Burgundian soils. So it would be nice to um, 
you know, develop more Pinot Noirs and the kind of red wine side of things because we think these are varieties that um, you know could do very well in this, this area. And steep slopes as well. The only slopes I've seen as steep as here are in Germany. We're working in Germany. There's a couple of vineyards in England that have got slopes like this, but generally there's gradual um, south-facing slopes, whereas here we've got you know, 10, 15, 20% slopes, which, um, you know, is actually, it's quite tough for the that's vineyard funny team. Would, that's but, funny how you wouldn't think that that would make a difference, but it, yeah. it does. Yeah, well, um, you get a lot of free draining soil. Um, it's very important. And, um, and sometimes the vines, when they're put under stress, um, they, they produce better, better fruit. Um, and when you've got a steeper slope, you've got the sun aspect as it, as it goes around. Um, you get less um, um, less shadows. Uh, just get more. Uh, it's more degree, exposed. Degree, degree it's days, yeah, more summer, exposed. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. This is one that um, I've had before. Is okay. it? Yeah. So um, Rye. It was my birthday. I was seeing Rye, and um, Rye got me a bottle of this for my birthday. Okay. Yes. Didn't open it for ages. Right. And then finally did when lockdown happened. Yeah. And I'm really sorry to say, but I drank it all in one sitting. Okay. By well, that's what it's for. Zoom party. That's yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Lovely. Um, so this is the other wine that I thought you'd like to try, uh, but you've already tried it. Um, mm -hmm. Is uh, Cotswold Classic. No. Wow. So it is, it says the name, well, what's the word, what's the expression? It says on the tin? No. Yeah, yeah. Names it on the tin. what it says on does the tin. what it says on the tin. So it's from the Cotswolds and it's a classic cuvee, would be the French term. Um, it's not made from champagne varieties. It's made from primarily, predominantly from Saval Blanc, which is a variety um, which grows really well here high yielding, very good for sparkling wines. We also use it in the, in the Culver Hill. Um, and it starts off very citrusy and, ends, and turns into some really interesting stone fruit um, characters over time with the, with the bottle aging. Yeah, it's got a great core. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so yes, it's mainly so Saval Blanc. It's, got, it's actually got 10% uh, Pinot Blanc in as well. It has... Um, so the lease aging, so the amount of aging that it has in the bottle for the second fermentation is about 15 to 18 months. Just a little bit because I've got to drive. <laughs> yeah, we've, um, yeah. Um, Brilliant, thank you very much. So yeah, 15 to 18 months and um, cheers. Clink. Um, and it's been a really popular wine because it's easy drinking, it's quite fruit forward um, and... Um, and it's not ridiculously expensive. The thing with uh, quite a few English wines is that they're priced quite high, um, you know, and, um, and this is the kind of wine people seem to buy and then come back and buy more than one bottle for a party or for guilty. <laughs> like, guilty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cases. You know, that is me, that is me. You know, for an event or birthday, that kind of thing. And, um, and because of that, yeah, no, it seems to be very popular. Oh, no, it's yeah. delicious. Yeah. It is very good. Which I was going about to say, we were quite surprised about. I was to start with, but um, actually not, because um, it's just really approachable, nice wine, and people don't need to think too much when they're drinking it, because it's got a nice flavour, it's got a nice fizz, and um, it's not, it doesn't cost a fortune, so people don't have to, you know, you know so... Um, so yeah, well, but we've been very pleased with it. Yeah. Well, very the, the market wants what the market wants. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm very happy with that. That was the one thing I was really excited to <laughs> have another glass of yeah. when we came here. It's very good. So very quickly, because I know that you've got mm. to shoot off soon, but Jeremy, what, what are the plans now for the future? Obviously, we're here to, we hope pe more people buy this wine because yeah. it's delicious and mm. people know where to find you. But yeah. what are you hoping to do whilst you're up here? And, and obviously, you've managed to turn, turn this into a proper tasting room and things like that. What's the next step? Are you planning on making any more obviously if it's secret don't tell us but yeah. are you planning on making any more bottles or yeah. different kinds of wine anything yeah like well that? um i'd say definitely speak to fiona about a long-term project for for wichester valley but um as a winemaker here i um we have released a pinot noir red uh which got received very well in 2016 small amount 17 a bit more 2018 which we're going to be releasing at a year in barrel now it's in bottle 
and that's going to be released in November. So um, I'd like to make more still wines mainly from Pinot Noir maybe. Um, Chardonnay is looking very good this year, so uh, more Chardonnay. Chardonnay. Yeah, so just, um, you know, we, we last year we didn't make any Sauvignon Blanc because it rained quite a lot during harvest, the ripeness wasn't that great, so we made Atkin White, which it wasn't because the Sauvignon Blanc wasn't good, it just was better blended with Ortega. It brought out some really interesting uh, mid-palate characters. Um, and so it's just um, introducing interesting new wines when, when, they, when they, you know, when the fruit seems right in whichever year, which is nice to do. Um, but keep the consistency really with the Bacchus and the Colver Hill. Mm. Uh, the rosé is, uh, is going down really well. Our new sparkling rosé has just done really well at competition. So um, it's more um, developing sp- sparkling wines as well as the stills. But um, personally, um, I really like Pinot Noir as a variety because you can make very good um, sparkling wines in England with it. Um, our reserve cuvee has the Pinot Noir and our sparkling rosé. Uh, you can also make uh, good still rosés and then you can make still reds in good years. So um, hopefully climate change will be <laughs> helping us. We get quite a lot of extremes. So we had a late frost, which wasn't very good this year. Mm-hmm. Um, the winds we had yesterday were a good example of, you know, unusual um, autumnal, unusual weather patterns, really. Mm. So, um, so hopefully we'll get some good hot weather during harvest this year and we can make some decent Chardonnay and still wines. But... Yeah, That'd looking ahead. That would be yeah, very be, exciting. I, yeah, I, I but, really like but yeah, so it. just um, taking each year as it comes really with which wines to make. Um, but um, one thing that's guaranteed in England is you can make very good sparkling wine any year. So so that's something we're focusing on. And the backer seems to be a variety that, not just in this country, but on these sites here, seems to do very well. So And, and the, the Pinot Noir for the rosé as well seems to do very well. So um, and The Pinot Rosé is love. Mm, you no, know, it's, it's really good. And I think we're a little bit of a microclimate here in the whole region, um, maybe the steep valleys um, and the soil type um, and the very good viticultural practice. Mm. Got to put it in there because it is true. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. it is, it does, that's how you make decent wine is with um, good fruits. So, um, so yes, um, um, hats off to Fiona. Yeah, um, about the quality of the grapes we get. Yeah, so amazing, um, brilliant! Thank you so much thank for you doing for this journey. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone who's listening or watching this right now, where can they find you? How best to get in touch if they want to book a tasting or if they're looking to another yeah. the bottle? What, what do they do? Um, have a look. Go online, our website, or speak to our excellent sales team. Come on the tours and tastings via the websites. Um, sales team are great. Ben, you're amazing. <laughs> he's there, out there, waiting anyway, to do a tour. Anyone who's just listening, we've yeah. had, um, we've had uh, him in the background yeah. of the shop. Waiting for... to sort out the tasting room for the next tour. So, um, But yeah, but have a look at the website um, and book online, really, or call us, call Ben or one of the sales team and ask about us uh, for, via that. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank Jenny. you. Okay. No. Cheerio. Thank you.